War II. As German V-2 rockets rain down on London, 27-year-old Arthur C. Clarke is stationed 250 miles away in Cornwall. He mans the Royal Air Force's top secret radar system, the Mark I. This precise equipment allows operators on the ground to talk down pilots landing in the dark. Clark realizes this new technology can do more than land planes. It can connect the human race. But only with the help of a vast, untapped resource. I can recall, with some embarrassment, using the dear old Mark I to fire single pulses at the rising moon, waiting for the echo three seconds later. Clark hopes the moon will serve as a natural reflector, bouncing radio signals back to any spot on Earth. He is disappointed. The moon is too far away. But Clark's impromptu experiment leads to a revelation. What if a man-made satellite was launched into space? Orbiting the Earth much closer than the moon, it could reflect the radio waves. So communications and astronautics were inextricably entangled in my mind, with results that now seem inevitable. Arthur C. Clarke's concept evolves into the most significant tool of modern communication. In 1945, Arthur C. Clarke invented the communication satellite. In an issue of Wireless World, Arthur Clarke came up with the idea of what he called the geosynchronous orbit, an orbit in which satellites that were lifted to that height would turn with the Earth and always stay above the same spot of the Earth. So you could bounce signals off it and use it for communications. And Clarke reasoned that if you could put three of them up, equally spaced, you could send signals between them that would reach any place in the world. In 1965, Intel Sat-1 is launched to a height of 22,000 miles above the equator, an orbit now known as the Clark Belt. Everything about geosynchronous communication satellites today goes back to Clark, and the orbit is named after him. Every time we watch a satellite broadcast on TV, or send a cell phone call, or even read a newspaper, we're interacting with the communication satellite. By envisioning the satellite, Clark creates the future he wants to live in, a world where the entire human population, from the largest cities to the smallest islands, are connected. This is one of the ground stations which form the Intelsat network, providing now global communications, telephone, TV, everything you want. And here is a model of this satellite. Strange looking beast. This is a very big thing, it's about 50 feet across. These pick up the signal from the station behind me and then amplify it and then beam it back. The technology Clark envisioned in 1945 has become the foundation of our attempts to understand humanity's place in the universe. Space telescopes are satellites that beam images of deep space back to Earth. NASA's newest and most ambitious space telescope is the Kepler. Taking flight on March 6, 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope is the first ever satellite solely devoted to the hunt for planets outside our solar system. The Kepler mission is a telescope orbiting in space, and it's out there to find out if Earths are common or rare. And so it really is mankind's first step the exploration of the galaxy to find habitable planets. William Baruki has long been inspired by visionary predictions of humanity's future. I remember walking to the uh, public library and getting all the books on science fiction. Any of the exploration things where people are exploring new situations, new beings, and the books by uh, Arthur C. Clarke where he talked about the evolution of man and the different kinds of technology that, that could be employed. The Kepler team designed their telescope to peer deep into the cosmos, 
to find corners of space unknown to man. At the top, it has a lens. It's called a corrector. Below, it has a big mirror, about five feet in diameter. The light comes in, hits the mirror, comes back up, and these antennas take the data that we've got and send that to the Deep Space Network. The Kepler satellite is elegant in its simplicity. It detects planets by measuring how much light is blocked when a planet passes in front of its sun. This is called a transit. On Earth, we can view such a transit whenever our moon passes in front of the sun. In deep space, finding an Earth-like planet transiting a distant star is a greater challenge. The information behind me are the light curves that we get from the stars, how their brightness changes with time. So these each represent several pixels for a particular star. Among these curves, we should be able to find tiny transits that would represent a planet among the stars. So when it goes across the star, the change of the star, it's 1%. What change in light would occur? If you just slide a piece of transparent glass in front of some light bulb, it's extremely small. So it's by far the most precise system to measure star brightness ever built. To date, Kepler has cataloged over 1,200 planet candidates. 54 of those planets are located within habitable zones and, in theory, could support human life. But the nearest is many light years away, and humanity has no way to get there. Yet. You can liken our quest to understand the life in the universe to what you saw in the Middle Ages. They wanted to build these giant cathedrals. They knew that when they built the foundation, that it would be their children that would erect the walls, their grandchildren that would cover the, the church, their great-grandchildren that would enjoy the interior and enjoy this wonderful structure. Generation after generation, the quest, the goal would be continued. And that's what we're doing today. Arthur C. Clarke sees a place for man amongst the stars and dreams of visiting them himself. To push humanity forward, he draws the blueprint for a new space age, an age where all it takes for anyone to explore the universe is a round-trip ticket.